The Accidental Entrepreneur is brought to you with the help of our sponsor, A. Weber, the world's leading small business email marketing and automation service provider. Since 1998, A. Weber has helped more than 1 million small businesses and entrepreneurs through its suite of web-based email marketing, automation tools, and education. A. Weber, the best option when it comes to marketing your business. The podcast is also brought to you by the Alternative Board. Since 1989, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has been one of the leading peer advisory and business coaching organizations for independent business owners and CEOs across the world. By facilitating peer advisory boards, private one-on-one coaching, and strategic planning services, TAB helps business owners improve their businesses in ways that change their lives. And be sure to check out our affiliate sponsor, One of One Productions, the New Jersey-based podcast studio that produces and edits both audio and video podcasts. They sell equipment for the average podcaster and have even created a guesting kit exclusively for our listeners. And be sure to support the podcast by ordering some logo merchandise from our online store. Listen to all of our sponsors' commercials later in this episode and follow their links in the show notes to learn more about their products and services. All right. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I have a, a, a great guest today, an author, an entrepreneur, and uh, James has a great story. His name is James Bond, by the way, so which is really cool. But we're going to talk about that. And uh, if you are listening on your favorite podcast directory, please leave us a five-star review. If you're watching us on YouTube, like us, subscribe to the channel so we can keep bringing you the quality content, the great guests like we have with James here today. So let's get on with today's show. The information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work, and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur, my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. All right, James. So thanks for coming on the show. I think we connected through Podmatch. I think that's how we connected. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Why don't we start with the first half of the show? We'll do like, you know, your story, background, experience in entrepreneurship, how you got into what you're doing with all the book writing you're doing and the advice and things like that. And then the second half, we can talk about the book. It's in the book, advice, what brain glue is. How it can benefit everybody. Is that, a, is that a good track to run on? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mitch. I'm okay. really excited to be on your show. I love this. Your podcast is awesome. Okay. So let me start <laughs> that. So, much. Um, so um, I'm, I live in Southern California, but I'm originally from Montreal. Okay. And uh, 37 years ago, we moved to Southern California. I remember that because we named our middle daughter. We have a son and three daughters. We named our middle daughter. We gave her the initials L.A. <laughs> so we went, Lauren Asia. Well, we knew. How old is Lauren? That's how long we've been in Southern California. So it's great. That's funny. Um, when, I was, um, when I was young, I'm a technical person. I have a mechanical engineering background, although okay. I started an advertising agency. And I loved that advertising. In school, they thing. didn't. Pardon? That makes no sense, but okay. Yeah, well, in school, they said I was great at math, but nobody knows, noticed that I love psychology and, and language and stuff like that and art. Yeah. Right. And I Here turned on to art with my electives in college, and it was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, it's, it, right. because it triggers a different part of the brain that I was yeah. used to. Logic is one thing. I'm a logical person, as most people are. Yeah. But I discovered the power of emotional selling. Um, okay. And that's why... I'll talk about the book, but, you know, it's it's about persuasion. And so I was in business with uh, one of my brothers and uh, my brother, John. I love my brother, John, dearly, but not in business. <laughs> okay, let me start there. Sometimes family <laughs> right, and business. Right, the only sibling feels that way, yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
Right. And uh, I built an advertising agency where we ended up having major clients like Kraft Foods, Timex Watches, Avon Cosmetics, Abbott Laboratories, Seagram's, or World Headquarters is in Montreal. And, uh, and, and James, uh, I, in those days, was it managing mostly like print ads and TV and advertising, things like that, right? Because there wasn't really any digital media in those days. Correct. Correct. Yeah, right. yeah. And so, but uh, it was fascinating for me. I mean, it was lots of fun. We did really great, great stuff, but I'm a very logical person. And I remember two things happened. One is we went into Avon uh, to win a major contract. And uh, uh, my brother, John, and I were sitting there and the buyer from Avon said, hey, John, it's between you and this other company, you guys and this other company. We'd rather give the work to you, but you're more expensive than the other guy. There's a pause and then my brother leans across the desk and says, why do you think the other guy is so cheap? There's a long pause and then like straight out of a textbook, the guy goes, the buyer goes, okay, I get your point. Let me write up a purchase order for you. Nice. I thought my head was going to explode. <laughs> they, they're hiring us because we're more expensive. <laughs> like, right. wow. I, you know, I would have tried to bargain my price. How much yeah. is the other guy and all that stuff? But we didn't do that at all. No, we hired do us. It. Hold on it, to it. it was just profound. And it's and that it just happened. undercutting what you what you're you presented them with certain things. You bring expertise to the table, experience, and you're undercutting that. By then backing off and saying, all right, fine, we'll do it at that price. I, you know, I get that in law all the time. I can't do better than the price I'm giving them already. I'm doing this for 31 years. I know what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, somebody else will do business with them. What can I do? And I think a lot of people are, I don't know if you agree, they're, they're like hesitant about that. They're just like, Absolutely. oh, okay, I'll do it cheaper. Absolutely. I, I mean, I do coaching for U.S. Small Business Administration. So I'll have like hundreds of people every year that I'll be coaching yeah. and, and training and all that stuff. And one of the things I teach them is answer this question. That's exactly the reason why. Right. Okay. Good question. So, yeah. So your price is higher than everybody else. Why should I go with you? Well, that's exactly the reason why you should be going with us. And let me explain that. Right. And then explain yeah. it. If you can't explain that, if you can't yeah. justify like why somebody should hire you. Right. You know, I mean, we have value. We don't drive the cheapest cars right. out there that are old used cars that are broken down and stuff like that. We don't wear the crappy clothes and stuff. I mean, you know, we oh. may not live exactly where we want to live and all that stuff. But it has a lot to do with emotion, and um, and emotion right. is Fair amazing, stuff. which right. led me to how I got into this in the first place, okay? <laughs> That's kind of a brain glue. So because we had done work for so many of the major companies, we had an opportunity to win the anti-drug campaign in America with powerful, of course, logical. I'm a logical person with powerful, right. logical reasons why you should not do drugs. And right. we lost. And it we deserve to lose. Right. And what did we lose to? The guy holding an egg saying, this is your brain, and cracking a shell and dropping the egg I into a that. sizzling yeah, flying pan. I remember that ad today. Your, exactly. It stuck to the, sticks the brain. If your brain on drugs, the first thing I see is an egg falling into a pan and frying up. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it blew my mind, but it made me realize, like, this is emotional selling, not logic. I mean, I mean obviously, your brain gets fried, but, that, you know, it, that's a metaphor. This is right. not emotional selling. And I couldn't understand, like, how do you create ads like that? That's so powerful. I'm a logical person. By right. the way, over the years, I've been doing this for over 35 years where I've been investigating this. And I realized, I discovered that there are major studies that show that more than 90% of buying decisions are emotionally triggered. 100%. That, first of all, that's why we get in trouble all the time because we make emotional decisions. We want logic, right? And then we want emotions to back it up. I mean, yeah, that's why we're consumers like we're nuts. We're just spending money and we're taking on credit and running up debt because we're it makes us feel better when we, you know, buy the new clothes or go on a trip or buy the new car or whatever. We make it happen. And, yeah, it's not necessarily good for society, but, you know, it makes you well, feel better. The, it's like drugs. It's literally like a drug. Exactly. But the problem is the best business owners are logical. We came right. up with, a, here's a problem. We're going to solve this problem. We have to understand the logic of what's involved and everything right. else. That has to sell their product. But you have to sell it emotionally because, right. and so we're such logical people and we're focused on logic. Hey, that doesn't make sense. We got to make it this way and everything else. That suddenly, you know, we're wired in to be logical. School taught us to be logical. School doesn't yeah. teach emotional selling. And so I realized no. like, how do I learn emotional selling? Because school doesn't teach it. Right. So I wrote your brain on drugs on a three by five card and I created a passion box right next to my desk. I put 
or to my computer, I put a box. And I said, okay. every time I see an ad or hear something that's emotionally profound or powerful, rather than trying to overanalyze it, I'm going to put it in a box in the hopes that eventually. Now, how long ago was this? How long ago was this? Well, that was 10 years. There was a 10 year gap between that and what I'm going to tell you now. Okay. So we moved to Southern California. I've been putting like, you know, ads and comments. Ask not what your country could do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I go like, wait, there's a pattern in there. This is really powerful. Put it in my right. box. Okay. 10 years later, I met John Gray and John Gray was telling me about a book he wrote, Men, okay. Women and Relationships, one of the best relationship books ever, but it frustrated him. Why did it frustrate him? Because he was telling me people read the book and they loved it. And yet I was only able to sell like 20,000 copies. And, you know, you, you have to do something. You have better work at McDonald's or somewhere else. You can't make a living yeah. off that. Okay. Right. And he said, and then I got this crazy idea. What if I change the title to, yeah. as you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, yeah, and then tweak really the true. content just slightly so it's consistent with the title. You know, I'll refer to it throughout the book, but it's basically the same book. What do you think happened? He's yeah. telling me suddenly That's overnight, so. half a million copies got sold, and a million, yeah. and then two million, and five million. I know Steve Harrison who helped him with marketing, and I said in the book, I say he sold – uh, 10 million copies. And Steve went, eh, wrong. I'm like, oh, did right. I over-exaggerate? No, because I researched it. 50 million copies. Yeah. He's already right. sold over 50 million books. He went yeah. from 20,000 to 50 million just because he changed the title? Wow. Yeah. You know? Right. So I it's wrote, still being sold today. You still can buy oh, it. Yes. Uh, he'll it's a he'll die and it'll still be for his grandkids. They'll still be yeah. selling. I mean, yeah. it's an amazing book, but it, it wouldn't have sold like that at all if he didn't change the title and so right. i i was like it blew my mind like you know the t a different title can suddenly make the difference between making it successful and not successful because it resonates well, I, with the emotional issues that everyone has in a relationship that men are like a funny. you know and it's a little funny too it uses humor too you know men are from yeah. mars what <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah i guess we are you know guys were like that's exactly true you know yeah exactly <laughs> we are from a different planet hey ladies out there you know anyway but yeah so as i'm writing men are from mars on a three by five card i realized wait a second this is a metaphor because men aren't really from a different planet although a lot of women out there particularly <laughs> think we are i know no, we seem totally like we're from mars okay right but anyway but but it's a metaphor and so, and I realized that, you know, this is your brain on drugs is a metaphor. So I realized like, wait a second, is metaphors the secret to emotional selling or at least one of the secrets? So when I got home, yeah. I dumped the passion box on my bed and quickly discovered that metaphors is one of 14 brain triggers at the heart of emotional selling. I thought my right. brain was going to explode. Well, and I said, it stays in there. It stays in your head. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And there are, th there are certain things that stay in your brain and certain things that don't. And so right. I'll take you through one of them and I'll give you a whole bunch of examples. And I think it'll blow people's, it, my book is blowing people's minds because they're going, oh, that's why, that's why they're successful. That's why that's yeah. famous, et cetera. But so Jack and Jill went up the hill. Huh. How what was the last time you heard that? Okay. I heard a guy, I'd say, obviously in England, they do it too, because he knows it in England. But I mean, right. You know, I'll be on my deathbed. The last time I heard it was like 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 years ago. I'm old. So what can I say? I can be on my yeah. deathbed and say, hey, James, what? Jack right. and Joe went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. I mean, right. it sticks to the brain. So there are certain yeah. things that stick to the brain. And in marketing, it's very important that when you can understand how powerful getting your ideas and concepts or product name or product description to stick to the brain or slogan to stick to the brain, your sales can explode. And I know right. I have these three construction guys. I didn't have the name brain glue yet. I call you know, but I understood the concept of it. Eventually I came up with the concept of brain glue because it sticks to your, it sticks to your brain like glue, these ideas. Yeah. But I have these three guys who are in the construction business and okay. uh, I was uh, coaching them and uh, they, uh, it took them 10 years to reach $2 million of sales. $2 million. That's not bad, right? Ha, ha, ha. In one year, I took them from two to 10 million in sales. What and were they doing? They were in the real estate business or you said they did construction they did project like homes and yeah, like, they built, right. Exactly. Homes and, so and, and, and projects. Like project. That's exactly. what they were doing. 
Yeah, exactly. So they, and random. I mean, so anybody who comes to them and say, hey, you're a construction company. Can you help us build, our, rebuild our kitchen or whatever else or build a house in the backyard or whatever else or, you know, yeah. and all that stuff. So I, in, in, it took them 10 years to reach 2 million in sales. In one year, I took up to 10 million. And then they reached 32 million in sales two years later. So how do we do it? Yeah. Simple, actually. First, I sure. pull out a whiteboard. And right. I love whiteboards. And I said, let's make a shopping list over the last 10 years. Let's make a shopping list of all the different types of clients you've gone, you've gone after. Okay. okay. So we did that. It took about an hour. You know, it's a, who else, what else, you know, and et cetera. And I said, okay, so let's play a little game. Let's pretend you're going to only say yes to one type of client and you're not going to work with anybody else. And they said, well, we don't want to do that. I said, I understand, but we're playing a game. Let's play the game, okay? Your ideal client is the only person you want to work with. Yeah, exactly. And so it took them a while, and they finally said, you know what? Fire restoration for insurance companies. I had to ask them what that is because I don't know construction. But that's, you know, every time they they had two clients. One client had two projects they gave them, and the other client had one project they gave them, but it was fire restoration. It's like when they had a client that had a fire, they had to call in a construction company to rebuild, you know, part of the house or whatever. Of course. Yeah, we've had fire, water, mold, whatever. You got to come in, and they got to rebuild it. And so company pays the bill. It's nice. they said, and so they said, okay, so we love actually fire restoration for insurance companies is pretty simple because the first thing we do is check the frame. If the frame of the house is damaged, you got to tear down the whole house. But if it's not damaged, then you just put it up, fix it up and everything else. And so I said, okay, fine. So fire restoration for insurance companies and insurance companies would be your clients, right? Yeah. So we need absolutely. a pitch. So the word fire is the first thing they think of because, hey, Joe had a fire. John Johnson had a fire in our house, whatever else. So why don't we use the word fire as one of the triggers? And why don't we call you guys the fire extinguisher for insurance companies? We'll get the website firex.com. They kind of laughed a little bit, but I went with them on two pro- for two prospects, uh, the first two. And we're sitting there and we're talking to the, cl- the prospect. And we said, yeah, just think of us as your fire extinguisher. Anytime you have a client that has a fire. Hey, we're your fire extinguisher at firex.com. They laughed, but they bought. Laughers are buyers, okay? And the phone started ringing. These guys had so much business. They went from after, they went from two to ten million in sales, and they actually razzed me. They said, "Hey, Bond, it was supposed to be twelve million. And my comment was, "Shut up!" They bought each other right. brand new BMWs you know, as gifts for three for three of them. You know, I mean, they couldn't believe how much cash was flowing in. But I mean, yeah. so take a look at here. Here, I'll get. I'll throw some terms at you. Okay. Use brain oh, James, tools. So, so as you're discovering this thing, this must have been really driving your business, right? Because now you're able to bring a different approach to your advertising customers, right? Oh, absolutely. It's suddenly we went from building advertising campaigns to renaming clients' products and businesses and then building the campaigns and sales exploded right. like crazy, as it did for us. But so let me give yeah. you some phrases, okay? Because I think these okay. are blow people's minds when you start to recognize how powerful they are. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit, okay? Yeah, right. Yeah. Rhyme the is most- really powerful. The right. whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. Okay, in the early days of the bread industry, Wonder Bread dominated the bread industry. They actually invented sliced bread. So whenever you hear the term, oh, boy, that's the smartest thing since sliced bread, huh, they're referring to Wonder Bread. They don't even realize it. But they bleached, uh, they bleached the bread. What and because happened of, before? You would get a loaf, you have to cut it yourself? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. Everybody cut their bread. They didn't realize. They never thought, kind wow, of- wouldn't it be cool if we got a loaf of bread and it's already pre-cut? But, <laughs> but you know. There was an illness. We had COVID. But back then, they had mm-hmm. this illness called pellagra. And pellagra was yeah. the absence of B, vitamin B3 would actually make you sick and die. Very similar to COVID. And so the competitors who hated Wonder Bread because they were competing with them, et cetera. Uh, two of the competitors came up with the slogan, the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. And back then they had mostly newspapers and I guess radio, but the uh, newspapers loved that quote. They went, whoa, the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. And they explain how, because they don't have vitamin B3. Uh, eventually Wonder Bread added a fortification of food, fortified food. They would put niacin, which has lots of B3 and other things inside it. So they actually invented that. If they wouldn't have invented it, they would have gone out of business. They almost went bankrupt because of the power of the phrase, the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. Here's some more phrases. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That uses a tool called chiasmus, which is a flip. Okay. 
And it's like, when you hear this, how about you know, uh, President uh, JFK said this also, the whiter your, uh, the whiter bread, the quicker to know. Um, <laughs> the, um, he said, uh, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. You hear right. the flip? It's really powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how about this one? Uh, Malcolm X, uh, civil rights activist Malcolm X, you loved uh, Bringo type tools like chiasmus. And he said, um, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. Yeah, no, I've heard that. Okay. Before. He also said, he, he said something that people don't refer to him because they don't realize he's the one that said, said this, but it was profound. When you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. You know, if he said, hey, look, guys, come on, you got to have to stand for something. That's one thing. But if you say a phrase like, well, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything, it sticks to the brain and it resonates. I guess uh, but Martin Luther King then it, it's ascribed to those principles, too. Exactly. He and he used passion words and emotion words. He loved those. OK. Um, um, Warren Buffett loved the phrase. Um, Only when the tide goes out, do you realize who's been swimming naked? Yeah, it's true. Okay. <laughs> Basically, what he's you saying what? is only when times get tough do you realize who's really competent, okay, who can handle stuff. Yeah. But if you say that, it kind of goes in and one ear out the other because that's logical. We know that. Okay. Uh, uh. But by saying right. only when the tide goes out do you realize who's been swimming naked. Yeah, oh. no, there's a lot of those, like, what are they called? They're like phrases, colloquialisms or something. Yeah. I don't right, know. metaphors. And there's Metaphor. also trigger words, okay? So <laughs> here's a trigger word. So there's this young kid who turned into a billionaire. Okay, and so let me let me give you the story. What does okay. what does Richard Branson and olive oil have in common? Uh, wait, virgin, you told right? Virgin, virgin right, olive right. oil and Virgin Airways, and he had Virgin right. Records. He recognized that Virgin is the trigger word. And so because he started early in his career with Virgin, now he, he started buying. He owns a gazillion uh, trademarks with Virgin is Virgin at red because he recognizes that Virgin is a trigger word. Okay. Right. How would you like to have the word dirty in your product? Okay. <laughs> dirty right. soap. I'm not sure I'd want to do that. But anyway, but it would get people's attention. So how about dirty dancing? Dirty Harry. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, dirty rotten scoundrels. You know, they're just, I'm trying to get the, these. Um, um, major newspapers and magazines to review my book. So I sent out this thing to 14 different uh, um, writers at uh, New York Times and other things. Yeah. And here's, the, here's, the, here's what I sent them, okay? Let me tell you the answer first. So what happened was literally within 24 hours, two writers immediately contacted me and said, you gotta send me a copy of your book, I wanna check it out, okay? But here's what, I, here's what the headline was. The dirty Sorry. truth about an article you wrote. <laughs> And then I explain, I okay. use the dirty truth because it's a trigger word and blah, 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 and everything else. And But two people responded like immediately. Read it. Read it, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So how yeah, about you tell him? Growing up, he always had sayings. He would say, don't eat an elephant in a day. I don't know where these came from. Maybe you can tell me. He used to say, and I use this with clients all the time, the ones that are hesitant, they're not sure, they can't make up their mind. I would tell them, you can't wait till all the lights are green to head towards town. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I love, that's but one of my know favorite that. lines. You're, it, yeah. We do business. We work with entrepreneurs. That is one of my favorite lines. You can't wait until all the lights turn green until you go into town. I mean, that's it's profound. Possible. It's a metaphor. Right. Profound. I have a metaphor for mine. Okay. And here, well, yeah. first, I, let me give you some phrases for mine. Um, okay. Switch your pitch if you want to get rich. That's a slick one. Okay. How about uh, I, I'll show you how to light the fire of desire in your buyer. Okay, that's a good one for sales. I yeah. went to Chat GPT and I want to see could they come up with one? Boy, it's sometimes you have to go through all these stupid they, responses before you get a good one. But I got one yeah. I thought it was pretty good. Why brain right. glue? Because plain glue doesn't stick to the brain. <laughs> I there just, you go. But here's a metaphor, yeah. okay? So uh -huh. you get out of your home and you're driving down the street. Yeah. You have all these homes or apartments down your street, okay? You're not going to look at them every day and go, oh, look at that one. Look at that one. Yeah, you're used to driving past the street. And you don't even okay, look at them because you're them. going somewhere, right? But one right. day, you're driving down the street and one of your neighbors, two houses down, has flames coming out of his window. <gasps> what? Trigger, your brain gets triggered immediately. Does he know the house is on fire? You know, is my house going to burn down? You know, we, we have to call 911. I mean, 
it triggers your brain. The flames come out of the window. And so what advertising works the same way and marketing works the same way. If we see product, 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 we want flames coming out of our products. So they go product, product. Oh, what's that? Huh? Oh, men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. What the heck's that? Right. Okay. Yeah. You want to grab their attention. So let me give you a few examples. A mom, a Utah mom and her son. A mom is sitting on the toilet where a lot of people get good ideas. Okay. On the toilet? Okay. On the toilet. Okay. <laughs> and she realizes that it's better for your body if you can raise your feet about six inches off the ground when you're going to the bathroom. I don't want to go through why and all that, but you can imagine. Okay. Was it the mom and the son that ended up on Shark Tank? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But how many people out there started a business with no business experience and within two years, you have more, less than two years, you have a hundred million dollars of sales. So yeah, it's hard. first they would call it, okay, the toilet stool, but that doesn't work. My wife said, why don't she call it the stool stool? But that doesn't work either. But right. she's thinking, okay, so what are some other words for stool, for toilet? Okay. Potty. Oh, okay. Potty. And I'm sitting and I'm kind of squatting a squatty potty. Because she came up with the name. Did you come up with that name? No, 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 I didn't. I, I, I've got a, a lot of people I've helped, like hundreds of people I've helped, which is really exciting. But there's some stories, and I want to share them because a lot of people right. know. Yeah. You knew. I, 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 uh, they were on Shark Tank. All the yeah. investors, I think all the investors were standing in line. They wanted to invest in their company. Why? Because it was selling like crazy. Why was it selling like crazy? It's just a stupid little stool. I don't mean stupid because it's a wonderful product. I mean, it's a little stool. But it's, a, right. it's called Squatty Potty, and it triggered the brain. So they had yeah. – um, There was another one. Remember the poopery, the spray was on there where you spray your toilet first, and it takes the smell away. They're all over my house now. Like, you know. Do you remember what, the, what it's called? Poopery. Okay. Poo if it wasn't called Poopery, would you even remember the name? I mean, I'd oh, here's one. Had some spray. Here's know. one. How would you like to invent a product? And your biggest competitor steals the idea from you and makes so much money that you have to stop selling the product because you can't make a dime from it. Because yeah, you're an idiot. Well, because you don't know brain glue. Okay, <laughs> let me start there. Okay, exactly. so yeah. Post Cereals competes with Kellogg's. Okay, they actually yeah. stole the idea from Kellogg's, and there's a whole other story there. But separate from that, so there was Post is successful selling cereals, and so was Kellogg's. So the head of Post Cereals came up with this idea and said, you know. Um, we should create this little cake that has nice jelly inside it, you know, strawberry, blueberry, raspberry, whatever. And you put it in a toaster and then it comes up nice and warm and you can eat it. And let's call right. it country squares. That's what a great idea. And they were so proud of this that three right. months, I know you know where we're coming from. Yeah. Three months before they launched it, he bragged to the media, I've got this new product coming out. Look at this. It's called country squares and it goes in your toaster. So the head of Kellogg said, what a brilliant product idea. That's brilliant. Hey, guys, we got all of guys. We need to make that product. We got three months, less than three months to make this product, okay? So they made the product. They invented a product that was the same as that, okay? Country Squares. Right. But then he says, I need to come up with a name that's going to really resonate. So first it pops out of the toaster, pop, pop yeah. art. Back then, Andy Warhol was famous, and everybody knew the term pop art because it referred to Andy Warhol and other pop artists. Uh, so why don't we call, they call it Pop-Tarts? Yeah. So let me tell yeah. you how successful Pop Tarts is. First, he, what he God, did was one of the most successful breakfast treats ever, right? Over a billion dollars. I mean, it's a multi billion product. But listen to this, okay? So um, he launched the product a week before Pop Tarts got launched, uh, but be, before uh, Country Squares got launched. That's the first thing uh, an enemy will do to you, okay? Right. I, oh, and yeah. and Pop Tarts sold out immediately. He was it sold out so they couldn't believe how much inventory that they, they they didn't have enough inventory. They, they thought it was going to be successful. It became a blockbuster of success. It sold out. He ran full page ads in uh, major newspapers like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and stuff like that. Well, not Wall Street Journal, but New York Times and you know major newspapers. And he apologized and said, "I am so sorry. We've run out of pop tarts, but hold on for about uh, you know four or five days, and we'll have more coming up." Everybody waited for pop tarts to become available again. Nobody bought Country Squares. And that's why within a year he they stopped post stopped selling country squares because nobody was buying it. But Pop Tarts sold through the through the, you know a gazillion of them. They couldn't believe right. it. Well, what a terrible name. Country Square. What does that mean? It's a breakfast cereal. What am I eating country squares for? What well, some bad advertising you know? came up with 
word. Thought it was a good thing. Why don't we do this, James? Let's take a commercial break. I got to play some commercials and then we'll come back and talk more about brain glue and the book and how people can use it. And this is all great stuff. I love it. So let's take a break. Here's a word from our sponsors. Looking to market and grow your business? Or perhaps you're just getting started and want to hit the ground running. AWeber is the best choice for online email marketing and automation of your business. From maintaining a subscriber list to drip campaigns and landing pages, AWeber gives you tools and integrations that make marketing easy and fun. As our partner and sponsor, we use all their tools to promote the podcast and market our law firm. AWeber, the best alternative for online marketing. For over 30 years, the Alternative Board, or TAB, has built a thriving community of forward-thinking CEOs and business owners who want to radically improve their companies. Through unique combinations of one-on-one -on -one business coaching, participation in monthly TAB board meetings with other non-competing owners, a suite of strategic tools and customized strategic planning workshops, TAB membership can deliver greater strength to your business and a better work-life balance for you and your family. All packaged in a streamlined and affordable service that the people at TAB invite you to try risk-free. Maybe you're looking to get into podcasting or you just want to market your business. Maybe you want to do it for enjoyment or because you have a message you want to get out there. One of One Productions is a New Jersey-based studio just over the George Washington Bridge that caters to the booming business of podcasting. They offer a comfortable atmosphere using the latest technology available to record your podcast. And they are a full service media company offering both audio and video production services, creating both audio and video podcasts, as well as video shorts for business and personal use. Professional audio equipment packages are available through their website for all budgets. And be sure to check out their podcast guesting kit created especially for our listeners. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show. All right, James. So we are back talking about really cool stuff. I think, you know, people don't recognize that when they're struggling, that people make emotional decisions when it comes to what they do. And if it's not emotional, they don't remember anything. So let's keep going with the book. I love the phrases. I love the stories. I, I always love those like unknown things. Like the pop tart thing is great, you know? But and, and it, what's good about like, this, what's good about this is this applies to, B to B or B to C. So if you're selling to consumers, Correct. so we have uh, squatty potty, but we also have porta potty. Okay, porta potty yeah. uses alliteration, a repetition of sounds. I remember I was sitting uh, in a car with uh, my grandson, who's like six or seven years old, and we're driving under a bridge, and we saw one of those. And porta potty has competitors, but I said, right. "Hey, you know what that is?" He said, "Yeah, that's a porta potty." He's a six-year-old, yeah. and he knows porta potty. Okay, yeah, we have big ass fans. I mean, uh, Carrie Smith. Okay, he was he had a manufacturing company and he was starting to become a little successful. So he bought a friend's company and made fans, huge fans that are used for farms mostly. You know, in a barn, you're not going to put air conditioning. You're going to put, right. uh, you know, to air condition your horses, or your cows. You put a big fan. Right. Yeah. And so he was running ads and then he said, you know, how do I describe this? And he said, what do I call a big ass fan? Let's see what happens. Big ass fans became this from his ad became massively yeah. successful, and he started thinking maybe I should call the company the the products big ass fans and change the name of the company. He did, and sales exploded. Okay, so then what happened was he started selling other products too because sales were doing well, and then he realized that's distracting me from fans. Let me just focus on fans. After 15 years, so he got the company, and, and it was not many, many, not many sales, but after 15 years, he sold the company for $500 million. How many people, you know, after Just 15 fan. years, are happy to sell their company for, and get some money to retire? He sold it for- Five million would be a bonanza. That's right. No, he just, you know, 500 million. I mean, and it's because it was so powerful. They use it in warehouses now and all kinds of things. But it's big ass fans. If he said big fans or Joe's big, I mean, the, and the logo is funny. He has a donkey with the butt facing us. Okay, the butt of the donkey, and his face yeah, is so off in the distance, turned and looking at us. Okay, but I mean, it. We have to remember, you know. I mean, I know these guys who created a business that uh, they started selling rags, and uh, it's called um, a New Pig Corporation. Okay, and they would, and they when they started their business, they were selling rags. They'd import them from China and other places, and all that stuff. And they'd use yeah. them in in car, in you know, car maintenance shops and stuff like that. 
And uh, they came up with the idea because it was a, a nickname for rags was uh, pigs. I don't know why, and they don't know why, but they thought it was cool. Why don't we call ourselves New Pig Corporation? Why don't we put our salespeople with a hat? They show up with a hat with a pig snout on the front and a big twisted tail on the back. And we say, hey, if you buy, our, buy rags from us, I'll give you a copy. I'll give you one of these hats. And they would laugh. They were laugher, laughers are buyers, okay? Yeah, right. Now, you don't always have to do that. You can be serious, but just understand, like, it can be tremendously powerful uh, when you have a name that resonates with the audience. Now, it isn't just names. I want to give you just this because I think it's so important. So we often say we'll throw numbers at people, okay? I work with a lot of finance people, so you live in a number area and you throw numbers at people. So right. let me give you a phrase and let me show you how to – punch up the phrase okay so the mm -hmm. phrase is in america americans discard 2.5 million plastic bottles every hour wow right. that sounds like a lot doesn't it 2.5 million plastic bottles every hour what if i add this phrase americans discard 2.5 billion uh 2.5 million plastic bottles every hour that's enough to reach the moon every three weeks yeah well that obviously it resonates now you see what it really means you have perspective you have perspective. Yeah, right. I tell people when you're selling, okay, when you're going out and selling, you want to do past, present, and future. You know, we yeah. had an advertising agency. So we would say to a client or a prospect, have you ever worked with an advertising agency before in the past? Okay, have you ever worked with an advertising agency before? And whether they say yes or no, it doesn't matter. We're going to say, well, what worked for you and what didn't work for you? Right. Now, are you working with one right now? And I don't care if they say yes or no. We say, well, what's working for you right now and what's not working for you right now? Right. And then in the future, you know, well, if you had, if you were able to work with an agency that was just perfect, what would you love to have happen that's not happening now? Past, present, future. But it's perspective. When you do yeah. perspective, it makes it much easier to relate to, you know. And so, yeah, it just it, it's just when you look at the brain glue tools, and that's what it, that's one of the things. And my wife wants me to remind everybody: this is an easy read. People are floored by how easy it is. Okay to read and the reason is i guess i have add or adhd or something like that but i just want to like tell the story you know make it jokes it works with jokes too by the way but it works in business it becomes a secret power tool you know i mean yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of one so yeah, jb I, I figured there is a methodology i want to talk a little bit about that so absolutely absolutely there are 14 brain no. triggers okay but so let okay. me give you uh, another example just uh so there's there's JB Weld is considered the strongest glue that you can get, adhesive that you can get. Okay. And it's competing against Gorilla Glue. Yeah. Who do you think is more successful? <laughs> you go to, I'm I go sure. to like a Home Depot, Gorilla Glue has a whole column of all the different right. products. And JB Weld has like about three or four little samples up there, you know? And it's because Gorilla Glue, it just, it resonates with the brain. Gorilla, it's like, wow, this is as strong as a gorilla. Branding and marketing. Yeah, exactly. And it's, we want to understand how the brain's triggers work. And so uh, let me go through some of the some of the brain triggers, okay? And they're really yeah. powerful. Um, so the first one I have is, because I want to do the upfront piece first, is set expectations. You want to set expectations, okay? okay. If you don't set expectations properly, um, well, I want to back up for a second. I, want to, I love Zig Ziglar. You love Zig Ziglar. Yeah, Zig, sure. Zig Ziglar, I, I, you know, he changed my life. He told me I went to a workshop with him early in my life, and it just I was terrified of selling, and suddenly he opened up the door for me where I started to love selling. And yeah. he said, "Selling is nothing more than a transference of passion." Okay, but he has yeah. this great line. I don't know why people don't talk about it more and more, but it's just a profound line, and it's we live in a world of, of text. We're texting people. We're sending emails. Okay. Look at how easy it is for people to misinterpret or misunderstand a text you have. Oh, yeah. I always tell people, don't communicate. I did that. not say he beat his wife. Okay. How many ways can you interpret this? I didn't say he beat his wife. Somebody might have said it, but I didn't say it. I didn't say he beat his wife. I might have applied it. I didn't say he beat his wife. And am I talking about tennis? Right. How many Doesn't different ways to pick these words can you misunderstand it? So I'm doing a I'm doing a workshop with about like 150 people, and this woman comes up to me at the break uh, for the small business administration. A woman comes up to me at the break and says, "I love your workshops, but why do you scream?" 
And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Do I do? I came from a big family. We had to. He said, no, no, no. I'm not talking about that. Every time you send an email, you're using all capital letters. That's uh, screaming. Oh, yeah. I didn't understand. Oh, right. I thought she well, meant the way. Text very important because then you don't you both talking the same language, so to speak. Exactly. So they're huge. Yeah. So there's something in brain glue, and I talk about it in a book called Redintegration is the backbone of most of brain glue, okay? And it's the brain's need for completion, not reintegration, but redintegration, which is the brain's need for completion. So let me give you some examples. So what's the most powerful tool of human interaction? I'm using it now, aren't I? Can you tell what I'm doing? What am I doing? I'm asking Talk. questions. Question. Questions are really powerful, aren't they? Yes. See? And I would say this to an audience of like 300 people. I say, if I keep asking a question, you're going to keep answering it? And they're going, yeah. I said, well, how about now? You know, it's the need. I said, you're not moving your heads, but you're still in your head. It's programmed well, that's into why you. The method of teaching is so effective. Exactly. But here's, yeah. here's a tool that your whole audience of all of you, if you can understand the power of this, this will change your life. It changed my life, okay? Isn't it? It's simple reflexive questions. Isn't it, doesn't it, shouldn't it are simple reflexive questions that you add to the end of your statements, aren't they? Right. Okay. Gosh, and when you I add this, I had, are and so I had a friend and I said, you know, like I live in Southern California now. I said, well, what a beautiful day. That's what I would have said. But because right. I'm programmed to say, you know, isn't it, doesn't it, shouldn't it? I said, what a beautiful day, isn't it? And he goes, yeah. Eh, yeah. Well, what's wrong? Uh, nothing. No, come on. What's wrong? No, I'm just. It's not, it's not a big deal. So what? It's, oh, my girlfriend, I'm just having a problem with her. And I got to talk about it, talk to him, okay? Right. When we're talking to clients and prospects and we're trying to sell, if you say, if you wire it in so you ask questions, I mean, we've had this. And I remember this, okay? We had a coaching program and so yeah. uh, behavioral management program. And so we would say, you know, so da -da -da, does that make sense? And we would just, it's wired into me so I can't not say it. And I, right. they, I could see them going. And I remember this one prospect who went like, mm, yeah, does that mean yes? <laughs> no, it means there's something else going on. I said, well, oh, what's wrong with this? And, uh, no, it, it looks good. I said, no, but what, 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 what's wrong? I'm not sure we'd have the time to be able to spend to do it working with you guys as a coach. And then suddenly it opened up the idea for them. It opened up, it helped me grab a, um, you know, an objection early when it happened. The biggest right. problem with objections is if you're, if I'm talking for 15 minutes and five minutes into it, you come up with an objection in your head from that point forward, it's going to grow and you're going to have a harder time getting them to say yes. Absolutely. But if you can add, isn't it, doesn't it, shouldn't it, don't you agree? I'm telling you, it changed my relationship with my wife and with my kids because right. suddenly I, I said to my daughter, like, Hey. How's it going? And she goes, oh, okay. My daughter, Laura, our middle daughter. I said, well, why? What's wrong? Said, nah. And she told me this. She said, because you're a consultant, you always try to solve my problems for me. And I, I feel like you're, you're almost, it's almost like you're saying, you know, daddy's smart and you're stupid. And so daddy's going to help you solve the problems. And I said, really? I don't mean it that way at all. I said, that's how it feels. It's like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> it's like the, uh, what's the technique? Feel felt found, right? Yeah, right. Right. I understand how you feel. A lot of people have felt that way, but when they found that they could do this or that, they're much happier with what it's yeah, the same. That's brilliant. There isn't, was that when isn't I, it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Right. <laughs> so when I was at Cornell, this is interesting. When I was at Cornell, the I think it was the biology professor and uh one of the law professors in law school got into an argument about the Socratic method, about asking questions. And the law professor said, I'll tell you what, we're gonna switch lectures. I don't know anything about biology. You don't know anything about law. I'm going to switch lectures. I'm going to give you my books. You can read, get prepared for the class, and you will go, and I will teach the biology lecture, and you'll teach the law. The, the biology teacher was way out of his element, didn't know what to do, and didn't. The students were coming up to the law professor telling him it was the greatest lecture they were ever in, and he just asked questions. And yep. you would say, well, this is this. And he'd go, okay, well, why, why is this? And he would be asking questions all over the room, and the kids were all engaged, and he proved his point. Well, I, when I, questions are powerful. I used to yeah. walk in with our advertising portfolio. We, I'd go through the whole portfolio. Hopefully something was going to resonate. And that's how I won Seagram's. With Seagram's, it was the first one that I recognized the power of questions before, during, and after. And I said, you know, I know your Seagram's are the division I was working with. 
have you guys ever uh, worked with an ad agency before? Obviously, or Seager. I'm just saying, well, yeah, on the big side, mm -hmm. but in certain of the elements, we don't. You know, we do it internally. And I said, so what worked for you and what didn't work for you? And he started explaining, we spend $50,000 to $100,000 a bottle for product design. And because the bottle is very important because a lot of people are going to choose it based on it sitting on a shelf or in our ads, you know, we have things that are old. So we have to make it look old, but we can't make it look like crappy old. We've got to make it look, you know, fancy old. Yeah. And so the bottles are really important. And when I heard that, he said, and so we have a lot of advertisers that just don't understand how important the bottle, the shape, the texture of the label is. And I said, oh, wow, well, we work with a, a lamp manufacturer doing a lamp catalog. So I, instead of going through my whole portfolio, hopefully something would work, I pulled out one sample. And I said, here's a sample of uh, stuff we did for a lamp manufacturer. And you see how I made the, it had crystal glass and all that stuff. We made the, it, you know, resonate and all that stuff. And he went, oh, I got to work with you guys. You guys are just, uh, I showed him one thing. I mean, the old yeah, man have to show to my To share with you what a lot of people speak and they try and sell to people not knowing what's going on in their head if you just ask them questions get them to tell you they'll sell themselves exactly exactly yeah. exactly yeah, no. so to me there are the two sides and the first one is you have to understand redintegration which means the brain's need for completion but the brain's need for patterns it likes patterns that's why squatty potty work because i said right. squatty potty and it resonates with the brain or porta potty it's it's ass it's uh you know yeah. it, you hear a repetition of sound okay and so i'll give you a good example um okay. for dryer's ice cream it was started during the great depression and you know people weren't buying ice cream during the great depression <laughs> And so they came up with this. Back then, ice cream had three flavors, chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. That was it. Right. And they came up with the idea of um, um, Rocky Road. And I want to give you why Rocky Road became massively successful. There are three reasons, three brain glue tools that they used, okay? So the first thing is when you open Rocky Road ice cream, it doesn't have rocks inside it, okay? Now, let me share that with everybody, okay? There are no rocks inside Rocky Road ice cream. It's chocolate ice cream with nuts and marshmallows. But it's bumpy right. like a rocky road, so it's kind of cool, okay? So that's the first thing. You use the meta, they use the metaphor, rocky road, because it's not really rocky road, okay? The second thing it used is alliteration, the repetition of sounds, ru, ru, rocky road. And I started to realize how many blockbuster products use alliteration. Coca-Cola, Best yeah. Buy, PayPal, TikTok, you know? It's a multi-billion dollar companies use this. Now, yeah. people say, well, they're rich. No, no. Many of them started poor and they figured out, you know, they, they benefited from this. Where they read your book or whatever it happens to be. Exactly. And so that's so alliteration, Rocky Road, road, road Rocky Road makes it easier. Marilyn Monroe. OK, there's a whole story with that. But so that's that. But the third thing they used was. Right. It was a name she was given. That's right. It was Norma Jean. It was Norma Jean Morgan, Mortensen, I think, or something like that. Uh, so I'll tell you how that works in a second. But but so with Rocky Road Ice Cream. It was also invented during the, the the Great Depression, and the nickname for the Depression was Rocky Road. We're all on a rocky road. So their concept was, we're all on a rocky road anyway. We might as well eat Rocky Road ice cream. <laughs> and people uh, are kind of laughing while they're buying. Okay? Yeah. So um, redintegration is the brain's need for completion. We like balance. We like symmetry. My wife hates it when some guy has a lazy, lazy eye. And she says, you can cover up one half of the face. And he looks like one person. Cover up the other half. He looks like a totally different person. Well, that bothers me. Okay. Yeah. So we like symmetry. But because we like symmetry, asymmetry grabs our attention too, which is when there is an imbalance. Okay. And so here's an example. Marilyn Monroe, she was Norma Jean. <laughs> Here we go. You do that every yeah. day and then people will start noticing you. <laughs> okay. That's right. Um, so... Um, he was Norman. blinking one eye, by the way, <laughs> everybody was listening, but, nice. um, uh, he, but he, here's what Marilyn Monroe. So her name was Norma Jean Mortensen or something like that. And her, her agent told her, you should change your name to Marilyn because Marilyn is a better name for models. So she said, okay. And I think it was her stepfather named Monroe. So she named her name and gave herself Marilyn Monroe as the name. Alliteration, repetition of sound, Mama Marilyn Monroe, so that helps. The second thing she did was she loved um, a Jean Harlow, who was a famous actor in the early days of the movies, and she had platinum yeah. blonde hair. So um, and Marilyn went to uh, the same hairdresser as Jean Harlow and got her hair colored exactly the same color. Okay, 
that she has a beauty mark on her cheeks so she'd already covered up with makeup. But one day she's looking at uh, pictures of Jean Harlow and she goes, wait a second. On some of the photographs, she, Jean Harlow has a beauty mark on her cheek and some of it is on her chin. And she went, wait a second, I bet she doesn't even have a beauty mark. I think she's just putting a dot on her face to bring attention to herself. Right. And so she started darkening instead of hiding the beauty mark on her left cheek. So right. um, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, sorry, I want to remember her name here. Um, uh, Cindy Crawford became a supermodel, okay? And Cindy yeah. Crawford tells a story in her bio that when she was a little girl, she begged her mommy to take her to the doctor and get rid of this uh, birthmark that she has over her left lip. And, her, yeah. and she says, I am so glad my mom never did it because I believe I became a supermodel because of that beauty mark. Okay. Right. So what made me start researching this was I saw this woman who has a big beauty mark, uh, a birthmark over her, uh, her eyebrow. And I went, wait a second. Cause I was researching, um, um, uh, what's his name? David Ogilvy, who's a famous advertiser in the early days of the advertising industry. Yeah, Ogilvy and, and Mather is it the same? That's right. That's, that's the one. And Got and he, David Ogilvy was brilliant, and he was advertising Hathaway shirts. By the way, Hathaway became so successful that Warren Buffett bought it. Berkshire yeah, Hathaway right. with Hathaway shirts. Okay. Right. But so. How did but he, I don't how think did, he bought the company because they were doing well. I think they were struggling. He got the company and he used it, didn't he? Uh, no, I think they were doing well. And he, they were just, they were? yeah, I think they were. But anyway, let me tell you how they became famous because they did become famous and massively wealthy because of this. So if you're running an ad for a shirt company, you know, in magazines, so what would your mm -hmm. ad look like? I have a good looking guy wearing one of the shirts, nice pair of pants and shoes, and I guess in a nice environment, right? Jay Peter so, and Cap. Every time you look at an ad for shirts, they look the same because they're all the same basic idea. So what did he do? He put an eye patch on the guy. The guy wasn't a pirate, but he put an eye patch on the guy and he called the headline, the man in the Hathaway shirt without ever explaining why he has an eye patch. And so you also resonate the name. Okay. Hey, look at the guy with the eye patch, the man in the Hathaway shirt. And sales exploded for Hathaway shirts, you know, at that time, because every time you see an ad for Hathaway shirts, you see a guy with an eye patch. Because he you recognized, it. yeah, the power of asymmetry is like, you know, we're used to everything looking balanced, but this is unbalanced because the guy's got an eye patch and he's still a good looking guy in a nice background, the man in the Hathaway shirt. And that's just like uh, Marilyn Monroe, like the dot on her face, she believed as uh, did, uh, you know, as, as did um, uh, Cindy Crawford. That yeah. yes, this is what helped me become successful and famous because people notice me, you know. And, and in fact, um, um, look at her earlier picture, Marilyn Monroe. She doesn't have the mole. Correct. Until correct. Late on. correct. Yeah. And so, uh, I, when she did the movie "Women Men Prefer Blondes" or something like that, one of the movies she did, she actually had a joke that she covered up the the birthmark on her cheek and she put it on her chin just to have fun with the audience, you know. But yeah, but no, she recognized the power of asymmetry. And so that's right. why to us, it's patterns. It's symmetry and asymmetry. We have to understand that the mind is, the brain is wired for patterns. And when you can use the patterns, your sales can absolutely explode. And it's just, it's amazing how easy this is. And it's amazing. I mean, I'll go back to John Gray. He changed the title of his book and suddenly sales went from 20,000 to 50 million. Okay. Right. Hey, all you out there, you come up with an idea, you know, again, the squatty potty, they had no business experience, but they came up with a cool name that's memorable, that relates. And they're, they reached a hundred million dollars in two years. Not bad. Right. How much, how, how long is it going to take all of us to reach that? Okay. I mean, you know, I'm doing well, actually, but I want to say that, you know, just what we want to do is we want to understand the importance of brain triggers and we want to yeah. use them. And I had somebody yeah. say, you know, well, that's like, you know, manipulation. It's not. It's not manipulation. It's making the brain easy to understand certain things. And in well, fact, I think a lot of remember you more than they remember everyone else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's why. You know, I mean, that's why it's important for us if if you're trying to communicate a message, because this is a book, even though Brain Glue is about selling for businesses, it's really about persuasion. How do you get people to, you know, buy into yeah. your idea or your product? And that's why right. civil rights activists use it. Uh, but marketers need to use it. If you have a product or if you have a crazy idea, I mean, she was the squatty potty lady was sitting on her toilet and she came up with this idea. You know, a lot of people come up with other oh, ideas. Right. Here, here's an yeah. example. OK, so Paul Tran. Uh, sorry, I'm into toilets and stuff here. But Paul Tran, 
it invented an electric razor for man's private areas. I don't want to get too much into this, okay? But he was yeah, thinking, like, what's the, yeah, okay, there you go. But it, what's the what's the shaver called? It's called uh, the lawnmower. He called his shaver the lawnmower, and then he decided, well, I should call my company Manscaped, you know, for landscaping yeah. a man with a lawnmower. So if I was telling a friend, if I bought it, I, I don't have one, but if I bought one, first, I wouldn't share it with my friend. Let's start there, okay? But I'd share the story with him. I'd say, hey, guess what I just bought? I bought the lawnmower. Oh, why? You have to mow your lawn? No, it's for <laughs> shaving right, my private areas. Oh, and he'd laugh, and he'd start telling a friend also, hey, guess what James just bought? Things we tell people exactly. That's, that's right. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. And that's what you right. want is you want to create a name that resonates with the brain that they'll remember when they're ready to buy if they're not ready to buy right now. And that they'll share with other people so that you'll make a lot more money without having to spend a fortune. And yeah. last story on this, okay? But so okay. there's a stay at home mom who created a Facebook page that has five more than five million fans, including me as a fan. And she okay. spent, guess how much she spent on advertising to get 5 Zero. million fans? Zero. Right. Zero. How'd you like that? How many people do social media marketing and you spend a fortune? And do you have 5 million fans? I bet not. So how does she get 5 million fans? Right. So she said, okay, I'm going to create a Facebook page. And what should I call it? That's a, I'm a mommy. So let me call it mommy. Mommy needs time to herself. Mommy needs a rest. I know what mommy needs. Mommy needs vodka. <laughs> that's the name of her page. So I'm sitting there looking funny. at here's how she gets fans, so many fans, okay? So I must out of five million people, I must know somebody and they shared a post with me or something. Right. And I looked at one right. of her posts and I went, Oh yeah, it's pretty funny. Ha huh? ha. And I said, It's from mommy needs vodka? What the heck's that? I clicked right. on the link, it took me to her page, I saw some of her other posts, and I said, Okay, I gotta be her fan, fan, and I became a fan. Yeah. Long ago, more than five million people, and that's why when you wonder, Brain Glue is about not spending a fortune. There are companies, there are people out there, and there are tons of people. I give examples who had no money and they were competing with a giant. You know, Adwala was owned by Coca Cola, and along came Naked Juice, and they zipped past Adwala and they like dominated. We have uh, in Southern California, we have um, In and Out Burgers. They didn't have right. money, but they're competing against. You know, McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy to spend tens of millions of dollars. These guys didn't have that much money. It's a family business. It's grown like right. crazy, okay? But in yeah. and out uses chiasmus, which is a flip, the opposite, okay? In and out, okay? Right. Also, in and out means like sex, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> so well, they it doesn't had a mean anything to do with burgers, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. And so, right. <laughs> exactly. So that's why, you know, when you look at stuff like that, you know, you realize that, wow, I mean, I was I saw a show on the History Channel the other day, and it was talking about Bobby Flay. I didn't know who Bobby Flay was, but as I was talking, no? it went like, oh, yeah, he's a famous chef and all that stuff. He's got a show. So what's the first show that made him famous? Boy Meets Grill. Right, I remember that. Right. Instead of Boy Meets Girl. Okay, he knows in everybody's mind is Boy Meets Girl. So I'm going to call it Boy Meets Grill and have a funky ending to it right. and on the Food Network. And it, it, it took off. It became famous. Now there are a lot of good shows on the on, on the Food Network, you know. And Jamie Oliver has a show. It was had a show. It was called The Naked Chef. Okay, I remember naked, it. the word "naked" is a brain trigger, you know. Yeah. And so when you understand these tools and you start applying it, people, are, I'm telling you, people go crazy. I was joking with this woman who has a candle company. She has about a million dollars of sales. She did uh, candles for um, Ellen DeGeneres and some others. And sure. uh, but her sales were starting to lag off, and so I said I was talking to her about brain glue, and we're, and I was just joking. I was just joking, honestly. And I said, "Why don't you call it nose noodles?" I was talking about alliteration, repetition of sound. And she said, "Oh, I got a great product for that." And I said, "No, no I was just kidding. So I don't care. I'm going to try it." And she's launched this product that they sell in pet stores, and pet yeah. stores love this. They put it right by the cash, and it. It's when you light the candle, it creates a smell that removes the smell of dogs and cats in case you're afraid that your house smells like dogs and cats. And they call it nose noodles. And she says, people remember it. They love the nose noodles. It's like, I'm just kidding. But it works. So, so James, would you say your book is more for business owners or more for uh, individuals? Or what would you say your audience is more for? I know anybody can use the concepts, but what would you say? Well, it's about persuasion. And the bottom line is it teaches you the backbone of persuasion. If you're in business and you don't know, I got Jack Canfield who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He sold 500 million books. And he's, 
he's forcing everybody in his company to read it and apply it. Okay. Right. So it, it applies. So if you're in business and he has this line, he says, if you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't, you know, you don't read this book, you're insane. Okay. Thanks, right. Jack. You know, it's really well, nice. his book, even the title chicken soup for the soul is people relate to that chicken soup makes you feel better. And it's a remedy and this and that. It took him over a month to come up with the name. He said he was thinking, you know, he was going to call it 101 uh, stories that would change your life. Okay. That's what he was going to call it. But he thought, yeah, that's, you know, that's, it's a, I can see other books having the same title. And so one day he woke up and he went, chicken soup makes you feel good when you feel bad. That's what my book does. It makes you feel bad. It makes you feel good when you otherwise feel bad. So why don't I call it chicken soup, chicken soup for the spirit. But then he said, it doesn't sound right. There's something wrong with it. He didn't understand brain glue back then. Now he does. Okay. But he said, chicken soup for the spirit. And he stayed for, he said for about a week, he was it's chicken soup for the spirit. It wasn't there, but he knew it was close. And then he went mm. S-O-U-P-S-O-U-L, soup, soul. Chicken soup for the soul sounds better. And then he came up with the name and the rest of they say is history. He sold 500, 100 million chicken soup for the soul books and 400 million of the other chicken soup for the teenage soul, chicken soup for the cancer survivor soul, et cetera. 500 yeah. million people. How many people live in America? You know, he sold 500 yeah, million books. Right, you exactly. Know? But it's just, so, he, he recognized know, that. Yeah, Sorry. I know we're running out of time. So um, you, you, you said there's like 14, we didn't go over all of them, but there's 14 different points in the book, right? Yes. Okay. And um, where is the book on Amazon? Like people can get it on Amazon well, and everywhere? Easy. On Amazon and other bookstores, but Amazon is an easy place. You can go to Amazon. It's got, lets you read like some of the chapters of it. So, and you can see okay. the topping list of the 14, which is really right, good. Just sample. Right, exactly. But yeah, you and, uh, you were yeah, asking go ahead. If, if you care about persuasion, if you're a public speaker and you don't read Blaine Glue, you're losing because it gives you, it shows you how famous people became famous because they came up with these little phrases. You know, like right. you and I love uh, Zig Ziglar. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, I mean, they're just famous. Jack Canfield was talking about how he's using these now. Okay. And because it makes yeah. your, your quotes memorable. But also, if no, you're in I- business, if you have a business, you definitely want to check this out because why struggle if you have such a good pro- if you have such a good product you came up with or a good service, you know you don't want to be like uh, Pop Tarts. Your competitor is going to come up with a steal your idea and come up with a better name, and they're going to make right. money and you're going to struggle. Stop struggling. Right. Right. Well, I remember the uh, that statement from Zig Ziglar: If you help enough people get what they want, you can have anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want want. yeah exactly and it resonated with me and i you know it's true and that's what you're doing you're helping a lot of people get what they want make it easier on their business so i can't light the fire of desire in your buyer (laughs) yeah there you go i love it i love it so enough for coming on and i guess are you on like linkedin people can connect with you online and stuff absolutely yep okay we'll put all the links in the show notes for the website brain glue and all that kind of stuff. And I appreciate you spending time with me. Well, what, what, for me is a Friday afternoon. For you, it's probably Friday morning because you're out in California, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. But yeah. Mitch, thank you so much for having me. It's fun talking to you. And I love I appreciate your podcast. It. You guys, even if you don't like it or don't like it, you've got to listen to his podcast. I was almost late for this one because I was stuck listening to more of his podcast. This is, you are, you rock. All right, stick around. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Accidental Entrepreneur. Opening and closing music written and performed by Howie Moscovich and Made to Order Music. For information about Howie and his music services, please follow the link in our show notes. If you like the podcast, please tell others about us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Amazon Music, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and most of the other podcast directories. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review and feel free to share our episodes on social media. If you have any questions or comments, ideas for the show, or you'd even like to appear as a guest, reach out to us by email at info at bynackerlaw.com. The Accidental Entrepreneur is hosted by Mitch Bynacker and produced by Bynacker Law. If you'd like to learn more about our business and legal services, you can find us on social media or visit our website at bynackerlaw.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to our feed to be notified of all future episodes.